Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Lord, you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such that these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Tears that threatened to overflow, 
the choked up voice, and the fact that I had to look down, stare down at my script during the vows, rather than gazing at their faces as I wanted to do. I could be forgiven for this was my own son and his bride. And their hope and joy and tears came close to turning me into a blubbering idiot. <laughs> In that moment, I also looked into the face of my son's father, from whom I had been divorced for many years. He was visibly weeping with joy and pride and hope. The feelings that day were complex. The reality of the high incidence of divorce in our time mixed with that unquenchable hope. Few clergy I know are eager to confront today's gospel text. Jesus' sayings on divorce and remarriage. They may be like me, a person who has divorced and remarried, and sometimes wonder how I qualify to preside at marriages and counsel couples about to take that step. Even those clergy who have not experienced this themselves know that in the congregation, there are few, if any, who have not been touched in some way by the tragedy of divorce. In their own marriages, in their own families where they may have grown up in what we used to call broken homes, or walking a painful path with their children or grandchildren. There's another complicating factor for some of us about this text. We use this passage in another debate about sexuality. We say something like, Jesus was clear about divorce, but said nothing about same-sex relationships. Why then are our churches so casual about divorce, but so divided on the other? The net result is that our churches rarely talk about divorce. So when this text is read, it lands like a hippopotamus in the chancel. <laughs> We can't just walk around it and not notice. So how do we unravel the text? These are tough words that Jesus spoke, and fairly clear. They have long impacted the traditions and practices in the church. Think of the words, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. They're still part of the marriage liturgy. It's no wonder that the church put rules into place that forbade remarriage and denied the sacraments to those who divorced. It's no wonder that the job of clergy until relatively recently was to encourage couples to stay in bad relationships no matter what the situation was. My own concern in preaching this text is not about encouraging the continuation of unhealthy relationships. Instead, I am fearful of relativizing the words or rationalizing divorce by simplistically saying that our times, our understandings of marriage are not the same as in Jesus' time. Though so that's perfectly true. There is more to this text than just a prohibition against divorce. We know that this was another scriptural story where the Pharisees, the original religious officials, were trying to trap Jesus. They already knew the answer to the question they asked him. They knew the law of Moses, that divorce was legal. We know that divorce was a reality and that it was patriarchal. For many, only the man could divorce the wife. And there were two schools of thought on the reasons. For one, the only reason was adultery. For the other, anything that displeased the man could provide the reason. Burning his toast, no longer being attractive to him. We also know that there was no place in that society for a divorced woman no safety net outside of the family. And 
and we know that marriage was a legal and economic arrangement between families. A woman was property that passed from the father to the husband. So what exactly did Jesus do? Well, once again, he turned things upside down. He says the legality of divorce in the law of Moses was not God's intention for God's people. It was only necessary because of the people's hardness of heart. Jesus appealed in this text to a greater law, to the law of God's creation. The second creation story in Genesis, where God created Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life into the human one. Then, deciding that the human one should not be alone, God created the animals. Even that was not enough. So from the rib of Adam was created a partner, a companion out of the same flesh and bone. Meant to be a caring, loving, helping partner, living in harmony together. But the human beings, being hard-hearted, became estranged from one another, and laws were needed to regulate what was no longer the ideal, no longer God's intention. Even in the hardest part of this passage, where Jesus talks to the disciples about remarriage as adultery, he makes a dramatic, radical reversal from what was the case in that society. He suggests that it is no longer just the husband who can set his wife aside, but that both are equal partners in the relationship. In shifting from legalities to relationships, appealing to this higher law, Jesus moves from contract to covenant. That does not minimize the importance of marriage for Jesus. In fact, it raises the bar. The bar of God's kingdom, or what I like to call God's dream for humanity. In the kingdom, marriage is not legalistic, but a relationship. A relationship with God and with one another. In the perfect world that God desires for us, there is mutual respect, wholeness, and concern for one another. We do, of course, recognize how different marriage is in our time. Our expectations are different. It's not so much an economic arrangement now as it is a hope for mutual fulfillment. Our lifespans are longer. Marriage is not necessary for the procreation of children, something that was very necessary in biblical times. We have couples who are unable to have children for biological reasons, or because they marry after the childbearing time is over. We have couples who are of the same gender. We have couples who do not feel called to be parents. We also have a heightened awareness of the damage that is done in abusive relationships and know that there are times that a marriage needs to end for the well-being of all involved. The job for the church, then, is to acknowledge brokenness, not to punish, but to help in the healing, to walk alongside those who are suffering, and to create the kind of community that can support those who are wounded and vulnerable. The late Bishop John Shelby Song, a rather controversial person in the Episcopal Church, a, a wise one in my humble opinion, said it this way, the fullness of life for each of God's creatures is the Christian church's ultimate goal for human life. When a marriage serves that goal, it is the most beautiful and complete of human relationships. When a marriage does not or cannot serve that goal, it becomes
becomes less than ultimate and may well prove less than eternal. In such a case, the church needs to accept the reality and the pain that separation and divorce brings to God's people and to help redeem and transform that reality and that pain. He also says, in our broken world, ideals are often unrealized. Visions are frequently compromised and ultimate goals, it seems, are seldom fully achieved. When we fail, the church needs to meet us in our pain, to enable us to stand even though we have fallen, and to give us courage to live, love, and risk again. Some churches these days have created liturgies to recognize the end of a marriage, not to encourage divorce, but to help people reorder their lives in positive ways by acknowledging their own responsibility in the ending, by affirming what was, what is good in the relationship, and by making promises of goodwill and continuing concern for the other's well-being. A marriage is between two people, but it's also communal. When I bless a marriage, I like to charge the guests, not just the couple. I tell them that they are not just spectators in a special event in a couple's life. They are participants who were there to witness, certainly, but most importantly, to uphold and support the marriage in the days and the weeks and the years ahead. And that is the job of the church community, too. My two mountaintop marriage blessings are still going strong. I pray that the hope and the joy that they shared on their wedding days will continue to uphold and bless them.